So I wanted to make a brief comment about the latest quiz. Something interesting has emerged from the latest quiz. It's right, like, I guess we're really getting into impedance. We hadn't really done it to this extent before. And it's causing a lot of trouble for a lot of students. So let me wait until they compile back in, and then we'll, I'll talk real briefly about that, okay? It's about, it's about number two? Well, yeah, mainly, yeah. Number two. Yeah, it's, I think it's the deepest we've gotten into impedance. And it, sh it shows. <laughs> so, okay, all right. So, this is the fourth and final chapter of this course, right? And it's uh, so far we've been doing uh, the mediums here have all been one-dimensional, right? The string is really, you know, the response is in one dimension, a transverse to the string. Uh, bars, so uh, two types of wave, we did two types of waves in bars, K and KFCS have a short section on torsional waves in bars. I didn't cover that, but if you need it for the experiment, you, you observe torsional waves in the experiment. Actually, they, they're pretty clean in the experiment, right? Uh, just look at that section, you get the wave equation, All right? So. So what we're going to do now is extend, go to two dimensions. And then, of course, in the next quarter, it's going to be three dimensions, right? Okay, so the, um, we're going to get the standard wave equation here. In two, that's the subject, the standard wave equation in two dimensions. And the natural system to consider, the simplest, is what's called a membrane. So this is a... Um, it's, it's really a two-dimensional string, okay? The membrane here is perfectly flexible, just like a string is. It's stretched, it's under some tension, just like a string is. Um, and we're going to look at waves on the membrane. So this is, the waves will exist in two, they can, they exist in two dimensions, right? We'll take those two dimensions to be um, the x and the z axis. So the membrane in equilibrium is in the x-z plane. And then we're going to look at transverse waves on there. And we're, of, source, of course, going to assume that this is uniform. Uh, and why is the displacement of the membrane from the instantaneous displacement of the membrane from equilibrium? And it's a function of x, z, and time. We have two independent spatial variables now. Uh, the parameter for the membrane that we need to characterize the membrane, it's per, remember, it's perfectly flexible. And uniform, we need a mass per unit area. So we're going to use uh, following KFCS rho sub s, s is for surface, I guess, I would think. So we're going to have a certain mass per unit, just like we had a mass per unit length in the string, right? And we'll take this to be uniform. And now this is a little interesting. The, we need some kind of tension here. And it's not, I'll show you in a moment. It's, Tension, just the tension force doesn't do it. We need actually the tension per unit length. And this is um, per unit length transverse to the direction of, of the, uh, I don't want to say tension, of the, of the co corresponding force here. L I'm going to explain this, okay? But anyway, let me just say right now that this is a parameter that we need to characterize the tension. It's, the, the, it's uh, the, the stiffness here, and it's, it's not the tension. It's like we did for a string, it's the tension per unit length. So let me show you why that is. Here's a membrane, a top view of a membrane, and it's under tension. Imagine you make a little, take a scalpel and <laughs> make a little slit, right? It's going to open up because it's under tension, right? If you then imagine exerting a force to bring it back together, okay, that force is going to be proportional to the length. This is all on a tiny little scale here. The force is going to be proportional to the length. And that's how we characterize the tension in the membrane here. You take a specific length L here, you cut it, you find the force you have to exert to bring either, ha either part here back to where it was before you cut it. Divide, that force is going to be proportional to the length. Divide by the length and then you get something characteristic of the membrane and not how we're cutting it or anything like that. That's the tension per unit length. 
And you can see it's transverse, it's per unit length transverse to the direction of the force. The tension is really in there in all directions, right? I can do this in any direction. Um, but here, this is sort of an operational definition of how we get the tension per unit length. And we're going to assume that this is uniform. That if you make this cut in another direction, you get the same value. When you go through this procedure of taking the force divided by the length, or you move to a different point. So, drummers have to be aware of this, right? I was thinking about this. A, a drum head, you want it to be... I would think you'd want it to be uniform tension. So when you're um, putting a drum head on and tightening it, you know, you want to make sure you cross tighten it and do it slowly and uniformly so that it's... So you might say, well, why does it have to be a uniform tension? Well, I don't know. I used to play drums, but it was so long ago, I can't remember. <laughs> um, oh, here they are. But I can see one problem is, you know, if you're a drummer, you want to, uh, you get used to the feeling of the drum head and the response. And if it's different in a different place, that could cause you trouble. Now, it is going to be different when you get near the rim. We're getting way too into this. When you get near the rim, it's going to be different. I remember that. And, uh, but that can be used for an effect. But I think you want the, it, 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 a uniform drum head. So we're going to assume that here we have this, that this tension here that we've defined, it's actually the tension per unit length. And we define it by taking the force divided by the length here. That you get the same value no matter where you are or what the orientation is. What length is that? <coughs> it's a, any, you take a scalpel and you cut, you ma this is a gedanken, you do this in your head, right? You imagine you have a membrane and you cut it over some small length. That's your choice what that length is. It's going gonna, it's gonna to open up. It requires a force for you to bring, it, to bring it back. That force is going to be proportional to the length. If you double the length, it's going to take twice the force, as long as it's small length. So that's the, so we take the force which is proportional to the length. If we divide by the length, now we get something characteristic of the medium here. It's not how, what we're doing to the medium. We don't want to use this force as our parameter because it depends upon the length. We have to tell everybody what length we're doing here, okay? So, um, so that's why we deal with a force per unit length or tension per unit length. I don't know, does that answer your question? What was your question? Yes. What was it? Let's ask what that L was. It's just some arbitrary length that we choose in our heads. So this is the parameter that plays the role of the, the stiffness here. It's the tension per unit length, and we'll assume it's uniform. Um, so I've noticed I wanted to wait till the foreign USW students came back. Um, so it's become apparent on this quiz, quiz seven that uh, a lot of students are having trouble with impedance. This is the deepest we've got into gotten into impedance on a quiz, apparently. I can just tell you by the number of questions I've had from resident students and distance learning students. So anyway, hang in there and um, you can always ask me questions, right? A lot of you have. So this is a good learning experience here, this quiz for impedance. And I think this is the the deepest we're ever going to get into it. I think from here on it's going to we're going to back off a little bit, which probably you'll find you'll like that. <sighs> okay, so we're going to make the str same approximations with a string for, for a membrane. Uh, <coughs> small displacements from equilibrium, small slopes. <coughs> that'll you know the small displacements mean that, um, for, you know, the tension will be um, not dependent upon the amplitude. I don't know if I told you guys, but if, did I tell you this about a guitar? There's a guitar in my office, maybe you've noticed. If you take the lowest string and pluck it really hard and uh, look at it on a digital tuner, you'll see the frequency goes up is higher than it w is when the amplitude's smaller. Did I talk to you guys about this? Does this sound from when we did strings? I didn't? 
Yeah, so that's a nonlinear effect. And there are actually several things going on there, but one of them is when that string stretches a big distance, what happens to the tension? It's going to go up. It's going to go up. And it doesn't care that we assume that it's constant. Really, it doesn't, the string doesn't care. I can tell you that. I'm sure of that. So um, that's why I think there are, I, there are going to be other nonlinear effects there, but I think that's the dominant one in this case. I'm not really sure. But, uh, you know, that's reality. Nonlinearity is a reality. But uh, as long as we, you know, stick to our assumptions here of small displacements and small slopes. The small slopes allows us to make a, just like with strings, a nice approximation. You'll see it here. I'll point it out to you. But as long as we have this, we're going to have, because we're not stretching the membrane very much, the tension will be constant, approximately constant. So here we go. So here's the, the x direction. The z direction is um, the z direction is coming out at you here, or going in doesn't matter. So the z direction is perpendicular to the perpendicular to the sheet to the plane here. And so you see the x. This is the x direction here. We consider a little element. We're going to apply Newton's. We're going to do Newton's second law here to a little patch. And this little patch has some small width, you know, length in the x direction, dx, and similarly some small length in the z direction. So it has area dx dy. And let's look at all the forces on the patch. Well, from this perspective, I can see that there's going to be, because this will in general have a little bit of curvature here, this force cannot, is not going to cancel this force in general because their directions are different. See, they're not, they're not because of the curvature here. The tension was taking to be the same, just like we did with this. I think we might have been more general when we did a string, but we're going to go ahead and write straight off here and assume uniform. The tension doesn't depend upon the amplitude. It's just a constant. The tension per unit length, tau. So there's a force on this edge. Remember, this edge is coming out at you. And how do we get that force? Well, we take the tension per unit length and we multiply by the length, right? And here you even see it more dramatically. If I double dz, here's my patch right here. If I double dz, I'm clearly going to double the force. So uh, this is why, again, you see why we need to deal with the tension per unit length here, tau. So there's a force here, tau dz. There's a force here. It's going to be the same, but the angle, same magnitude, tau dz, because we're taking a rectangular patch here. But the angle can be different. All right? Does this all look familiar? So we did exactly this for the string. The only difference is, instead of tau d dz here, we had t. Instead of the tension per unit length times the length, which is has units of force. We just dealt with the tension T, which has units of force. What about with the X being perpendicular? Now we're looking along the Z direction. Well, it's essentially the same thing here, right? Um, we look at the forces, and now the force is going to be, the forces in general not going to cancel because the angle is a little bit different here by D theta. Z in the z direction. This is d theta in the x direction. So the best way to, to say what's going on here, I think, is that we have really a duplication of the one-dimensional string theory. Here's, this looks just like a string in one dimension. The only difference is the tau dz here. We know how to handle it. This looks the same, all right? So the net, to get the total force on the patch, we're going to find the force, the net force here, by taking the, the, the sum of these two vectors and adding it to the force here. So the net transverse force in the y direction is going to be just this little bit here due to this, due to this angle. So we take um, the force we take the force here <coughs> and multiply hmm. 
Yeah, you can see here that the difference between these two, oh, and we also have to take, uh, uh, I shouldn't be getting hung up on this. What's going on here? Okay, this is the force. This is the net. Hmm. I, I don't. I don't understand this. This is just, you know, this just think string theory here. What's, somebody help me out here. Just look at this one. Just think of this as a string. We don't have to worry that this is a patch right now. Okay, we just forget this. <coughs> we have the net force. This is a force that's going in the positive direction. This is a force that's going in the negative direction. So when, they add, when we add them, this is going to cancel with this. And this is what we have that's... Oh, yeah, I see it. God, sorry, I'm sorry. This is just string theory. We, we all went through this, right, in the past. Um, we have to, we, what we care about is the transverse force here. So we take this and we have to multiply by the tangent of the angle. But because the angle is small, the tangent of the angle is approximately equal to the angle. So that's why we need to multiply this by this. That gives us, that gives us this. And we have just a simple duplication here, because we have two, two directions. So these two forces add. And now we use the fact, we've got to get this in terms of y. So the, remember the tangent of theta, the, the slope here, dy dx, is the tangent of theta. But be, again, because theta is small, the tangent of theta will approximately, approximately be theta. So that's why we get this. We then substitute, uh, we then take a differential of this, because that's what we got to get, get rid of here. We take a differential that brings in the second derivative. This is just, just a duplication of what we did with strings. And then we substitute for the differentials here and we get this. This is the net force on the little patch. It's proportional to the area and it depends upon the curvature of the patch. If the patch were planar, there'd be no net force. Right? So it depends upon the curvature. So in, equally in both directions. There's no preferred direction here. They both contribute equally, the x and the z direction. So you see how they enter here, both second derivatives. So before we had this, before we had this, right? Now we just have a duplication. That's the net force by Newton's second law. It has to equal the mass times the acceleration. What's the mass of the patch? Well, it's just the surface area times the, the mass per unit area. Rho sub s, the mass per unit area times the area. That's the mass. There's the acceleration. Now we cancel the differentials. And we're going to take... Uh, we're going to take the tau over here and put it underneath the rho s. You can see that all that's relevant here from a parameter point of view is the ratio of the surface, the aerial density to the t t t tension per unit length. That's all, all that's important is the ratio. And we deal with one over that ratio and we take the square, we deal with the square of it because we're gonna, we can identify this as the speed of waves. So you can see here that bringing this over here, going in the reciprocal, calling that c squared, this is what c is and this is, looks very much like a one-dimensional string and it has the right units. Before we had the tension divided by the mass per unit length. Now we have the tension per unit length divided by the mass per unit area. It, it works out same, the same units. One final thing here, and you always want to check, we've generalized. This is actually a generalization of a string by going to the dimension. We can we can retrieve 
the one-dimensional string case. How do we do that? We imagine that our membrane, here's our, here's our membrane, right? We imagine that it only has a variation in the x direction, that nothing's happening in the z direction. So it would, it would, at any point in time, the amplitude y does not change with z. So it's going to be acting like a string, right? It's spread out, but we don't really care because there's nothing going on in that direction. So we can check this by assuming that y is only a function of x and t, does not depend upon z. And when you do that, does that look familiar? That's the wave equation for a string. Okay, anybody have any questions so far? Uh, C in this case is still the one dimensional wave speed in that brain? Uh, it's the, you know, we can have, this is a two dimensional medium. The, uh, we, if you imagine a traveling wave, we're going to specialize to standing waves, but it, you know, it, this works for traveling waves. This doesn't care, right? This will work for traveling waves or standing waves. If you think of a traveling wa wave here, it can have, it can be going in any direction. Right? What was your question again? Oh, just. <laughs> C is still the, how fast it can go in one direction. In, in any direction, in any direct, any any in the plane here, okay. right? Because it's isotropic; it doesn't care. It's going to be moving the same speed in any direction for a uniform tension, which we've assumed, right? So you want to cross tighten, <laughs> like you do on a tire, right? When you're putting on, you guys know that you should. Okay. <laughs> any drum players here? Anybody? Anybody play a musical instrument here? One. Okay. All right. Oh, that's good. I had to replace a banjo that once. So. Oh, yeah. Same. There you go. Yeah. yeah same idea. Right. So they tell you to do that, right? Yep. Right. And it's probably also because of where, if you don't have uniform tension on a drum head or a banjo head or something like that, it'll probably wear out more quickly. <coughs> It probably is a, several problems why you, why you want to do it uniformly. It just seems like a good idea, right? <laughs> okay. Now, the next step here may look silly to you, but it's not. We're going to replace this with a different symbol here. It's called the Laplacian. And in our case, this is the two-dimensional Laplacian. And we write our wave equation like this. And you might think, oh, that's just to save time. And that's true, it, it is to save time. But it means it's more than that. Because we don't want to be wedded to using rectangular coordinates all the time. If we're dealing with a drum head, and we're going to talk about that, we're going to talk about a timpani, uh, what do you think, what kind of coordinates do you think you want to use? would be appropriate for a circular boundary. Polar coordinates, okay? So in the two-dimensional wave equation, um, and those are the only two cases we're gonna look at, but people have looked at others, you know, elliptical, there's other, a lot of other coordinates out there. But we don't wanna necessarily have to use rectangular coordinates, and we won't. So we'll be using, and I should have, Cylindrical is really three dimensions. There's a second derivative with respect to z here. So I really should have just said polar. You, if you have a hard copy, you can cross this off, okay? Um, we want to be able to deal with polar coordinates. And it turns out that the Laplacian, this operator here, which you can, you can see that the operator is two x derivatives plus two to y, y derivatives. You can transform coordinates and therefore transform the Laplacian. And what you can show, and some of you have probably done this in your distant past, um, you can show that the Laplacian, which is defined like this in rectangular coordinates, is equal to this in polar coordinates, r and theta. So this will be very important next quarter when we go to three dimensions. Sound is in three dimensions in general. And we'll be dealing with, so we'll do some cylindrical coordinates and spherical coordinates too. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so I was reading over these notes, you know, and it's been four years, right? I told you that, it's my, my excuse for, <laughs> right? Um, 
And I, I was having a little bit of trouble with this, this part right here. So I actually opened up the book, and it's not in there. Um, this is postponed until next quarter. And, and I think they're right, and I'm wrong. I should not have introduced this right here. This is, um, you know, talking about plane waves. This is appropriate for three dimensions here. It's true, this is true, this is what a traveling wave looks like. It's a generalization from what we've seen in one direction. You know, we've seen e to the i omega t minus kx. This is the generalization, but we don't need to, to drag it in for our work here, because we're going to go to um, <coughs> standing waves. We're going to spend the rest of the chapter doing standing waves here. So. If you, I, I want you to just forget this. Okay, I put an X through my notes. Just forget this from here to here. Cross that off. We, can, we don't have to worry about this. We'll get at the dispersion relationship a different way. Through, through, uh, specifically from standing waves. All right, is there any questions about this? It's, just, it's best to hold off on this. Okay, so here we go. We're going to do standing waves. We're going to assume the simplest kind of geometry here which is a rectangular geometry. Okay, so here's our, this is the t top view, I guess. Um, I'm going to make sure I have a right um, x Hmm. Well, unfortunately, we've got to take y in, right? Because I've got to have x cross y being z. It's just, you always take a right-handed coordinate system. It's not going to make any difference in this theory at all. But it's not worth playing around with the handedness of a coordinate system. You know, I could, this y can be in or out. We choose it such that x cross y is equal to z. So it's just not, it's not worth fooling with it. So here's our membrane. This is the origin. This is, um, and Y is pointing in. Here's the origin, and we'll call this LX, and we'll call this LY, and here's our medium, our, our membrane here. And we'll assume it's fixed all along its perimeter. Fixed all along the, the complete perimeter. That's the simplest problem. That's what we're going to look at. So mathematically, here's how we state the boundary conditions. This looks you see why you need a diagram here. Just look at these, <laughs> it's a little confusing, but it's, the information's in there. For x equals zero, and for all z, where the medium exists, we're gonna have zero. And similarly, here, all along here. So the information is in there, but this, this is much better just to show this. I'm sorry, why, why do you call it L, y? It should be L. Oh. Yes, sorry. That's a mistake. Thank you. Is it right in the notes? Yeah, LZ. It's right in the notes. Okay. Uh, okay, so we're going to look for standing waves. These are the normal modes of the system. Remember? Definite frequency motion. We're going to find waves that have definite frequency motion. And they're going to be standing waves, so we do the usual thing. We we take a displacement to be e to the i omega t, t times some spatial function, substitute that into our wave equation, and here's what we get. You can do this, this is easy, do this in your head. But we just have to leave this right now. <coughs> two time derivatives is going to bring down uh, two factors of omega with a minus sign because of the i. And so our wave equation is going to become this. This becomes sometimes called the time-independent wave equation. KFCS, and a lot of people call it the Helmholtz equation. Helmholtz extensively investigated this. Um, so we get this, right? And now we're going to define, for convenience here, we're going to define this quantity to be k squared. All right, and now I can see why I did this. <laughs> I can see, oh, where was it? I can see why I did this now. From, in this approach, you really don't know 
what k is, but you can guess, right? Omega is equal to ck. k is going to be 2 pi over the wavelength. But the wavelength is actually hard to identify here, physically, as you'll see. You'll see this coming up. But anyway, please write, you want to write here that we've defined this k, this quantity k, and the relationship here is omega is equal to ck. That's how we've defined k to be omega over c. You can see it going from here to here. Okay? So we know that, that's, that k is going to have the meaning of a 2 pi over a wavelength. It has to have dimensions 1 over length. Okay, so what's the next step? We've gotten rid of time because we're focusing on the normal modes. Eventually we have to come back and determine these frequencies. But we've been through this before. It's a similar process here. It's just more, more complicated now because we have this extra spatial dimension. So the next step here is that makes it fundamentally more complicated. This becomes a real partial differential equation. Before we had a partial differential equation in space and time. But um, we can often work around that like we're doing right now. We're, we have a pure frequency here. So before when we did this, we would end up with an ordinary differential equation. Now we have a partial differential equation here. So the standard method of doing this, some of you have probably seen this before, is use what's called the method of separation of, of variables. Has anybody, who's heard this, of this before? A lot of you. Okay, so it's worthwhile going through this again, I think. We assume, we consider solutions here. We're trying to find psi as a function of x and y. We consider solutions that are separable, and that, that by that we mean they can be represented as a function of just x times a function of just z. All right, so that's how we're going to, the function is going to be called capital X here, capital Z here. We make that assumption. And I have to tell you that in general it's not true. There are solutions that cannot be represented by this. So why, can, why do we do this? How can we do this? Anybody know? Because it works here. Because it works? Wait, because <laughs> I heard because it works, because someone did it before. <laughs> We're going to find all solutions here. We can then, okay, we're going to find an infinite number of solutions, I'll tell you right now. If we superpose them, we make an infinite sum of all the solutions here with arbitrary constants. They turn, it will be clear that they are complete. That means we can represent any motion as a superposition of these. So there could be a motion that you, that's not represented just by a function of x times a function of z. But it's going to be representable as an infinite series. That can be inconvenient, but for our purposes it's, it's okay. So this is really something that's justified in the end. We make this assumption here and in the end we're going to find that the because the functions are complete, it, this will represent, the superposition will represent any response. Okay, so we take this and substitute it into here. And here's what you get. Now I've made some, um, remember this is two x derivatives plus two, what, we're going to use the rectangular form here because it's natural for our boundary conditions to use the Laplacian to be two x derivatives plus two z derivatives. So you can see here that the Laplacian acting on this, the x is going to give us two derivatives on x times z plus x times two derivatives on z with respect to z. And we can use, because these functions are only a function of one variable, we can use the prime notation here. This double prime means two derivatives with respect to x, the only variable that capital X depends upon. And similarly for Z, right? The other term, we just get this. Now the next step here is to, ice is to, it's like a second step in separation of variables. We want to separate all the variables. This depends upon X and Z, right? You'll notice that if we divide by X, Z, what happens? We get this. Now we've isolated, the X variable is isolated to this term. This is only a function of x at most. What about this? It's only at, at most a function of z. This is just a constant. So this equation has to be, this is our wave equation, it has to be true. We're demanding that this be true 
And if I go in here and change X, I'm not changing these. Okay, you can, you can look at any instant of the motion. Take any point in the plane here, any point in time, any point in space, um, and then imagine changing the X variable. Imagine moving this way. Can this change? No, why not? This is the whole idea of the method. These can't, don't depend upon x. They can't change. And I've got to get zero. So I start off with some point. If, if I start changing the x value here, this can't change, this term can't change, this term can't change. So therefore, this term cannot change. It, you have, by adding all these together, we have to get zero. So we infer here that this quantity has to be a constant which we of course call minus kx squared. Now this is really just for convenience, okay? This is in hindsight. So we're gonna call the constant here minus kx squared. If it bothers you that we're assuming that it's a negative number, um, assume complex numbers. Make, this can be a com we can go complex here. So this is just for convenience. You'll see why it's done in a moment. What about here? What if we now start at some point and change in the z direction. Well, it's the same argument. This is at most, there's no, the only z dependence is here. If this changes with z, there's no way we can have this equality here. It has to be constant as I change z because these don't depend upon z. There's no way that they can adjust to balance this. So we have another separation. This is called a separation constant appropriately. We have another separation constant, which we're going to call minus kz squared. And now, to satisfy the wave equation, we see that this has to be a constant, which we've called minus kx squared. This has to be a constant, which we've called minus kz squared. They have to sum to zero, so we get this. And looking ahead to next quarter, what this is a state, this is what this is a statement of, is that the magnitude of the wave vector. This k here is the magnitude of the wave vector, which can be going in any direction. It's, it's the square root of the sum of the squares in the x and the z direction. It's Pythagoras. Okay, the next step here is to look at this, um, look at this equation. We've now taken, we've started with a partial differential equation, our, space, our Helmholtz equation, and now we've reduced it to two ordinary differential equations. Here's the x, and here's the y, right? You can see it right from here. And we've seen this, right? This is equivalent to simple harmonic motion. So what's going on in time for a simple harmonic os oscillator is going on in space here. And maybe a better way, a, a better comment would be, forget this, just look at this. This is what we would get for a fixed, fixed string. The way this is what we would get. We, we got this for a fixed fixed string. So our boundary conditions, we're looking for solutions here. They have to respect the boundary conditions. The x solution has to be zero here and zero here. So we went through this with strings. I'm just going to write down the answer here and you'll see that it's obvious. The general solution here, this is true for a spectrum, you know, an infinite sequence of functions and they're given by this the sine of kx, and you can see this very easily. If I differentiate the sine of kx twice, I'm gonna get minus kx squared times the sine back. This, it satisfies the equation here. Okay, and it satisfies the boundary condition at x equals zero. And it satisfies the boundary condition at x equals l because of our choice here, right? We've chosen, the, we have to choose the argument here to be an integral number of pi so that we get zero. We went through all this with strings. I'm just reminding you. So you see, again, you see the duplication here. Now in the z direction, <coughs> it's independent of the, of the x direction. We can have any amplitude, as long as we're still in the linear approximation, you know, any amplitude here. And this kz is in general different. <coughs> The length's different, but we just really just duplicate this result. And we have to put, there, there's no connection, there's no coupling here. We put a different integer here. 
independent of, we'll call it M, and it's independent of N. Now remember our relationship between omega from right from here, not doing this, which we've killed, from our identification here to get the, the Helmholtz equation, because if omega is equal to CK, we can now find our frequencies. We found the, perm the permissible K values, the discrete values of K. You just bring these lengths down here. And that tells us what Kx and Kz are. We substitute them into here. I'm to, I should have taken this, kill these twos. I should have made it just omega is equal to CK. And now we get this, right? Because remember, K squared is kx squared plus kz squared, right? So we take the square root, we get this, and now we almost always go to frequency here because we're going to typically deal with real systems here, and or even if it's just theoretical systems. It's nicer to deal with the actual frequency in hertz than radians per second, which you all know by now. So we're going to stick a factor of 2 pi in there, and here's the... Um, summary of what we've got. Remember, these two functions multiply each other. So here is the, the this is the spec, this is the, these are the normal modes. These are the standing wave nodes or the more normal modes. They're modes of definite frequency. Each one of these has a definite frequency. Now often something I just noticed here, people will write, this omega here depends upon the index. So people will often write this. I've left it off here. But um, these are the permissible, these are going to be the frequencies of the standing wave modes. And should, can we check the, um, I didn't, I don't think I said it here. Can we check the string? The string is really a special case of a membrane. How do we check the string? We just kill the Z dependence. Right, we neglect all the z-dependence here. And you get this. When you take the square root of this, you may remember this is exactly the frequency spectrum for a string. <coughs> fixed, fixed string. Precisely the... Okay, any questions so far? We're almost there. Now, one thing that everybody struggles with, and I mean everybody, okay? I went through this, it was a long time ago. But you'll notice this is not the sum, it's the product, right? You go back to the beginning, you know, it's, it's the product. We, this is where we, method of separation of variables here. It's not the sum, it's, it's the product. You can have a sum, you can have, this, this, this membrane can respond with um, two waves like this. Superposition applies here, but is it a normal mode? So I have, you know, half an integral number of wavelengths in this direction, a half an integral number of wavelengths in this direction. Is it a normal mode? No. Why not? Because You're right. And I think we're like that. Um. So we've got, you know, an integral number of, it's like a string this way. It's got a certain frequency. We've got a string this way. Well, mathematically, that's what you were just talking about. You're not adding, you're not, you're not adding. But suppose we do add them. That, that can't exist. I can have this thing behaving like a string with an integral, half integral number of wavelengths here, right? It's gonna have a certain frequency. I can have it here. In fact, we have a demonstration where we do that. It's because you're not independent. It's a non-linear, hold it. Sorry. <laughs> it's a non-linear demonstration and blah, 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 right? For the, the nonlinear course. So if you want to see it, you've got to take the nonlinear course. <laughs> so, uh, James, what are you gonna say? Oh, uh, they're not independent of each other? Well, they actually are. You can, the superposition applies it, but we have two different frequencies. In general, the frequencies, the frequency this, this is not a normal mode. A normal mode has to have the same frequency. And those aren't just words. The, the importance is typically we're driving something at a definite frequency, so it's got to respond at that frequency. So you can have, and again, we have a demonstration with this uh, very thick acrylic box. It's a, it's a nonlinear demonstration. 
and we have two loudspeakers here and two loudspeakers there, and we drive them, and we, you know, we set up a mode this way and a mode um, this way. We actually drive them with the same frequency, but that's not really the point. We don't, we don't have to. We could drive with a different frequency here and a different frequency here. But usually when we deal with systems, the important of neural modes is there's a single drive. We're driving it and we're sweeping the frequency. You've, you've already seen that a lot in the lab, for example. So we're, it's going to respond at that frequency. So you can have a sum here, but it's a completely two different frequencies in general. So these are the normal modes. Now I'm going to say a little bit more about this in a moment, this, uh, why that's the product. Let's now look at the graph. We have a nice, simple graphical way of, of describing what's going on here. So this is a top view. This is like you're looking down here. Okay. I'm going to assume that LX is greater than LZ, just to be general. They can be the same, of course, or LZ can be greater. But let's just, for definiteness, let's take this. The fundamental, oh, what's our fundamental mode? That's always important, right? Can I have M equals N equals, can I have M or N equal to zero? Well, here it looks like you can, but what's the problem here? Zero. If either M or N is zero, we don't get a solution. So we have to begin from N equals N equals one. That's gonna be our fundamental. And there's a nice way to represent this. This is really useful. We look down on the membrane, and now you can see here from, uh, from our solution, when M equals N equals one, this is just gonna be a half sinusoid. I don't wanna call it a wavelength. This is my way out. We don't wanna call it a wavelength, I'll, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But the fundamental, if you just think this is a string, we know the fundamental is gonna be half a wavelength, okay? And similarly here. So what we have here is we have this, going this way it looks like this, okay? And I don't want to call it half a wavelength because this system does have a wavelength. Omega is equal to CK. We have a definite K, we're going to have a wavelength. It's just hard to nail down and it's, it's not simply related to, to the disturbance going across this way and going across this way. So I'm going to call this half a sinusoid, okay? And this is half a sinusoid. And what's it doing? It's going like this. It's can do this. It's, it's, I have to respect the boundary conditions. It's hard to do. But uh, there's some 3D plots in the textbook you can look at. So. Every element, it's all fixed around here and it's alternating between coming out and going back in. So it's all in phase. Every point along here is in phase. That's what the plus sign signifies. The next mode here in frequency is going to be the 2, 1 mode. N equals 2. So this is two half sinusoids. It's one complete sinusoid in this direction and a half sinusoid here. And it's going to look like that. And here, it's looking, you know, it's going like it's going like this. So it has it hasn't changed. The dependence across here is across here is the same as the dependence across here. But what's changed is we've added another half a sinusoid in here. So these are 180 degrees out of phase. Those two reasons. So we can denote that by this. And here's the node. We can also have the one, two mode that's just like this, but now it's going in the other direction. What's going to be the relationship between the frequencies here? You can kind of feel it, can't you? You can look at the math, but see how we've scrunched up this, sin this single sinusoid here and made it a lot smaller? This is going to be higher frequency. And that information is precisely in here. It's right in here. When LZ is small, let's say it's much smaller compared to LX, you start incrementing this, you're going to get big contribution, big frequency change when LX, when LZ is small. Okay? Now, that's, people usually don't look at it that way. That's the correct mathematical way of looking at it. But remember, in this mode right here, there's really nothing, there is something going on in the z direction. We have a half a sinusoid. <coughs> but, um, uh, 
So you can't really think of this as a, it's not rigorous to think of this as a string here, but everybody does. Everybody sees this <laughs> as, as a string here. And they see this is a string going this way, and because of the, the wavelength is smaller, they see this is a higher frequency. But I just want to warn you that that we really shouldn't think of this as a, a full wavelength across here. The wavelength can be gotten from the wave number. And um, so that's why I think it's better just to think of this. We can build up all our modes here just by adding another half a sinusoid in either direction. So here we've done it in both. <laughs> this is now a single sinusoid in this direction and in this direction. And now the phasing has to be like this, right? So when these two regions are out, those two are going to be in. And then half a cycle later, these are going to be out and those are going to be in. Uh, finally here, it's, I told you it's often important in acoustics and you're, you're seeing this in the lab, to identify the fundamental note, mode, know about the fundamental mode. It's, uh, going along with that is Usually, because we typically free sweep with frequency, you want to deal with the ordering. You want to know what those modes are as you increase the frequency. So what becomes important is the ordering of the modes in order of increasing frequency. How is this in order of increasing frequency? What do you think? And we, remember, we can always calculate these. It's hard to sometimes see the relative frequency here, but it's all precisely right in here. Right? In the formula. So here's going to be the low, this is the lowest frequency, the m equals n equals 1. This is going to be the next one because this one, you can, because of this smaller distance here, this one's going to be a higher frequency than that. Okay, this will be even higher because we've got more, and it all comes from that formula. But what about this mode? This is now, you know, we went here and we had two half sinusoids. We can add another half sinusoid. That's going to be a mode. That's the 3-1 mode. What's the relationship, do you think, of this frequency compared to that frequency? So to get it, you know, the precise math is in here. But you want to look at this physically, and this is what acquisitions do. You see how we have a smaller distance here, the half a sinusoid is smaller? This one is going to be next in order. This one, because this distance is bigger than this distance right here, and this will be, you can get this out of the formula, okay? This one is going to be right there. That's probably going to be, that's going to be the next one. So it's natural to think here, well, what's the formula for the ordering of these modes? No formula exists. No one's ever been able to do it, and I don't think they ever will be. There's no explicit formula that you plug in your, what's important here is the aspect ratio, this distance compared to this distance. And, um, you know, you can scale this up, right? If you keep the same aspect ratio, you're not really changing anything. There's no formula where you plug in the aspect ratio and it'll tell you how the modes are ordered. You have to actually go through and do these one by one. That's just the way that it is. <laughs> oh, there's one final comment. Sometimes two modes can have the same frequency. For example, suppose we had a square, suppose this were a square, in fact, almost close to that. What's going to be the relationship between this mode and this mode? They're going to have the same frequency. So we have a word for that. We say that the modes are degenerate. That's the word that people use. It doesn't mean like they're, you know, drunk <coughs> and smoking cigars or something. I don't know. <laughs> it, it just, it's just a word that somehow got used. It probably came from quantum mechanics. Yeah, we're over. Okay. Uh, anybody have any quick questions? So tomorrow, the circular membrane, which has applications to microphones.